So the whole premise of economics that a pound is worth a pound to us is bollocks from the fucking off, right? I mean, it doesn't even stand up to my dad, okay? That's how little experimentation you need to basically, you know, disquiet you about your faith in mainstream economics. Hello, I'm Rory Sutherland, and you're watching Pete's Behavioural Insights and Theories. Hello and welcome back to Pete Spitz. Today I am delighted to show you this conversation with someone who is one of the biggest names in the world of behavioural science and indeed in the world of advertising too, Mr. Rory Sutherland. If somehow you don't know who Rory Sutherland is, let me give you the rundown. Rory Sutherland is the vice chairman of Ogilvy, one of the largest and most well-respected advertising firms in the world. In the role of vice chairman, he was able to set up his own behavioral science team within Ogilvy, who you might know as the hosts of the excellent Nerdstock Festival. And as if that wasn't enough of a qualification, Rory Sutherland has not one, not two, but three excellent TED Talks, each sitting at over 3 million views right now, last time I checked. And I'm feeling extremely fortunate because over the last few months, I've had a few occasions where I've been able to talk to Rory one on one. In this conversation, we're talking about what I think is a really interesting topic, and that is evolutionary economics and how thinking about evolutionary economics can contribute to how we understand human behavior more generally. Rory has recently been very vocal about his passion for evolutionary economics, and so I wanted to ask him why. Very, very simply, um, as a marketer and as someone involved in marketing, mm -hmm. I am interested in all branches of heterodox economics. So I don't, I don't confine my interest to what's now called behavioral economics. And the reason I can explain that very neatly is that mainstream economics, neoclassical economics, whatever you want to call it, has created a model of the world which is completely marketing free. Okay, so if you assume perfect information, uh, you assume um, uh, stable preferences and you assume complete trust. Okay, you've created effectively a model of the world in which marketing wouldn't need to exist, which I think is why most people trained in economics kind of hate marketing because they see it as a necessary evil. It's an inefficiency. Um, it's, um, you know, what you might call it, 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 it. It's a cost to be minimized at best. Okay. And so almost by definition, economics is of interest to a marketer because if mainstream economics creates a world that's completely marketing free, all forms of heterodox economics which disagree with that mainstream marketing free model of the world may have something con to contribute to a marketer's understanding of human behavior. But I would give a kind of prior place to evenomics or evolutionary economics, because in many cases, the ultimate explanation for human motivation can only be explained with reference to um, uh, evolutionary explanations. Then Rory gave me an example of how considering evolutionary economics has contributed to his thinking and his conversations. You know, I think I think what's important, I remember this from a long time ago, and I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about this. I was involved in a government number 10 discussion on how you get younger people to sign up for pensions younger. Now, in economic terms, there are lots of reasons why you would want people to join a pension plan pretty early in life, because the gains are disproportionately high. And I said, yes, from a behavioral science angle, okay, there are lots of things you could actually do to improve the nature and design of pensions to make younger people uh, less disinclined to commit to them. Not least being some sort of drawdown facility. Because when you're 22, the idea of something that kicks in when you're 55 is so remote as to be almost a promise from another planet. OK, you know, it's just, you know, how will I be surviving at 55 or 60 is not a major preoccupation of a 23 year old. But nonetheless, it's absurd to ask 23 year olds who have no knowledge of the circumstances of their next 15 years to commit huge sums of money from discretionary income that they can't touch even in an emergency. That that just seems ridiculous. OK, and that's the behavioral science angle. But I also went to them and said from a deeper Darwinian angle, do not expect pension saving among the young to reach the levels that an economic model would project, however good your behavioral economics interventions may be, for the simple reason that a 25 year old's preoccupations are probably more around long term mate selection and, you know, finding a quality partner for life or more, more than one. We shouldn't 
you know, normalize. Uh, um, but finding high quality um, uh, reproductive partners, okay, is a greater preoccupation um, than saving for retirement, which in evolutionary terms kind of makes sense. And very bluntly, I said, I, I, I haven't done this experiment, but I can be fairly confident that if you go on Tinder, you'll find quite a lot of people talking about their cars or their holidays, and you won't find many people talking about their pension provision. Okay. You know, I, I may be wrong about this. I've never tried. Okay. But I imagine if you're a 25 year old and you invite someone out for dinner and you spend the entire dinner talking about long-term savings plans, that that's a little bit of a turnoff, should we say, compared to, I mean, I don't know, you know, I, 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 I don't know what works, Okay, um, but you know, you might understand why someone wants to buy a Ford Mustang V8 rather than invest in a long term savings plan at that particular stage in their life. And so it's worth remembering that, there are, that we, we're not aware of our deep set motivations because it, it pays us in evolutionary terms to have certain motivations that are opaque to introspection. And that's a very important evolutionary theory. It's also really important to remember that we don't perceive the world remotely objectively. Um, for evolutionary reasons. So there's a great book called by Robert Frank, which is called, I think it's the strategic value of the emotions. In other words, the value that emotions play, uh, often in a kind of game theoretic sense or whatever it may be, uh, in terms of, of promoting survival status and, and overall fitness, reproductive or survival. Uh, the important thing to remember there is that we tend to regard anything emotional as being, uh, you know, a a fall off from rational cold decision making and then when you look at the the evolution of humans within a social context what you discover of course is that um, an organism that was incapable of acting emotionally would fall prey to all kinds of reproductive dis and, and, and survival disadvantages just as, of course, that pers person with perfect trust and perfect information could never have evolved. I mean, if you can think of a worse evolutionary quality than being completely trusting, <laughs> okay, <laughs> in any competitive setting, okay, you know, completely naive trust would be a pretty quick trip to the cemetery. A yep. bit of praise, by the way, and I, I, I think it's important. Uh, there's a neuroscientist called David Rock who has a thing called the SCARF model. And he's a New Zealander based in New York. And the SCARF model is very clever. It, it's a mnemonic. And it's SCARF stands for Status, Certainty, Autonomy, Relatedness, Fairness. Now, I don't think it's a complete list. I think if you gave me a few weeks, I could add a couple to it. But it's very important in being five things that humans really prize and care about that economics doesn't make room for at all. Fairness, economics has no conception of it. Status, it doesn't, it doesn't fully understand. I mean, you know, um, because, uh, you know, and so, and also it doesn't understand, of course, the value of relative wealth, which is where status comes from, positional wealth, as distinct from um, absolute wealth in terms of utility. And so that, that's a very, oh, um, um, by, the, by the way, um, certainty is a really important one, because if you think about it in evolutionary terms, and, and this is another branch of economics, I mentioned network economics, complexity economics, ergodicity economics is another branch of economics, which looks at under multiplicative dynamics. One of the things that pays off is minimizing the variance of outcomes. And when you think about it, one of the weirdest assumptions of economics is that utility is additive because if you think of most things in kind of evolutionary terms a lot of things in evolutionary uh, you know in, in evolutionary terms are highly multiplicative you know only th you, you know you know the joke that ends with a strap line you shag one sheep right do, do you know that one uh, okay well it's, it's a joke really about reputation and it, it's, it's a guy who meets this guy and um, he, he says, to him, he said, you know, you're a fantastic guy, but do you realize everybody in town, it's often told about in, set in Greece, I don't know why, everybody calls you Dimitri the Sheep Shagger. And the guy says, you see that church on the hillside? I built that with my bare hands and I donated it to the community. But do they call me Dimitri the church builder? The harbour, those ships bobbing in the harbour, I built all of those from the finest wood. And I donated several of them to poor members of the community. But do they call me Dimitri, the boat builder? 
happened. The harbour wall, I constructed that, I laid down all the foundations and I paid for it to be built. But do they call me Dimitri the harbour builder? No, you shag one sheep. <laughs> right? No, the point about that is reputation is not an additive thing, okay? It doesn't matter what you do elsewhere. If you just do one or two bad things, it colours everything, okay? And so reputation patently doesn't follow additive dynamics, really. Okay, no one really remembers Jimmy Savile's great charity work anymore, do they, right? Okay, now, um, the point I'm making, you know, nobody's there going, yeah, but on the other hand, he did a lot of sponsored runs. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's not that kind of equation. And obviously, survival is highly multiplicative. You know, two disasters in a row, you get ill and, you know, you get isolated from your tribe, that's extinction. And the order in which things happen matters. And obviously, you know, what you want to avoid is three disasters in a row. So minimizing under multiplicative dynamics, you want to minimize the variance, particularly the downside variance of any decision you take. And mainstream economics, because it's assuming it's additive, doesn't factor that in. Because it just goes, you know, it's effectively win some, lose some. Yeah. And you, you had a great illustration of that in your book. Um, about taking a bet where you had a 50-50 chance of either mm. winning that's, or not That's winning. Ole Peter's great example. I think it's, um, there are various bets. I think, what is it? You've got a 50% um, chance of, of raising your wealth by 50% uh, and a, another chance of reducing your wealth by 40. And you'd think that it made sense to take the bet. But I think the way to phrase this, okay, is in economic models, it's win some, lose some, win some, lose some. It doesn't really matter. In evolutionary terms, it's win some, win some, lose some, lose some, lose some, die. You know, you only need three significant losses in a, in a row and you're out of the game. And the most vital thing in evolutionary terms is at least to stay in the game. Next, I asked Rory to explain to me why some biases don't really seem like biases when you think about them from an evolutionary economic point of view. What would, okay, hit, hit me with a bias then. Yeah. Okay, so I think the most obvious one is probably loss aversion. Um, or prospect theory. So why why does that not make sense evolutionarily? Well, um, the interesting one is, of course, it um, uh, in evolutionary terms or under conditions of under non ergodic conditions under multiplicative dynamics, uh, two things become very apparent. One, um, that loss aversion is not irrational. If you take that bet of mine, okay. All you need is two tails in a row, which is a one in four chance. And your initial stake is now so low that you'll need three heads in a row, one in eight, just to get your initial stake back. OK, so never mind evolution. Mathematically, that was a wrong assumption about, ra about rationality. So we don't even need evolution here. <coughs> we simply need some good physicists and mathematicians who can point out that actually economists have got the maths wrong. OK. They're treating it as a series of single shot games, effectively. And they're assuming that what works at the ensemble level in aggregate is the same as what works over time. And they're simply wrong about that. And we, you know, we just need to park that failure because it's critical. Okay, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's important concept in marketing because I always say, look, you're looking quite often when you look at customer data, you're looking at an average, which doesn't distinguish between 10 people buying something once and one person buying something 10 times. But actually, they're different. You know, they're not the same state of affairs. So there's, and there's also an interesting one, which I've discovered in mice, and I can't remember where I read it, um, which is that if you have a t-shaped maze which is the standard thing for mice experimentation might be rats i can't remember if it's rats or mice and nine times out of ten you put the meat in the left hand side and one time out of ten you put the meat in the right hand side what you weirdly discover is that the rats or mice 90 percent of the time they turn left and 10 percent of the time they turn right okay over over a long period of learning now you could say this is irrational because the highest payoff is going to be obtained through turning left 100% of the time, because that's a 90% payoff versus 10% payoff. But there are, there are several things going on there which change the nature of rationality, one of which is there are likely to be other mice or rats around. And if everybody turned left, the food in the right-hand area would go completely uneaten. Okay, so socially, in a social setting, the other behavior is 
more rational than it appears. Secondly, of course, those conditions might change, okay? So it probably pays you to continually check the alternative hypothesis because the assumption of the scientist who, who's declaring the mice irrational is that they've evolved for an unchanging environment where you don't need to continually refine your models of where foods to be found. And so it's very similar to the random bee question where some bees disobey the waggle dance. And what looks like an inefficiency is, of course, a necessary investment to update your uh, informational sources. Because if you, if, you only, if you only follow the waggle dance, the hive will get trapped in a local maximum. And then some cows would wander into their three favorite fields and eat all the flowers. And they'd starve to death because they didn't know where to go next. Also, of course, they never get lucky. If you don't actually experiment with the alternative hypothesis, you never make a lucky fast discovery, which is that's strange. The guy on the right of the team maze has become suddenly very generous. And so there are lots and lots of reasons where the, the, the bias emerges from the absurd assumptions that underpin the model, not from the ultimate behavior of the organism. I think even in an unchanging environment, it's still worth it to do something different 10% of the time because you know 100% predictability is the fastest way to get predated on as well in evolutionary terms right yeah, well that's that's the great thing and I suppose the art of war will tell you a lot about this which is uh, that anybody who is completely rational uh, uh, complete rationality is a disastrous military strategy because your enemy knows exactly what you're going to do you know the whole purpose the d-day landings okay uh, the whole point of landing in Normandy was precisely because the crossing was longer. Now, as I once joked, if procurement had run the D-Day landings, if the procurement function of the army had run the D-Day landings, they would have insisted on crossing Dover to Calais because that would have minimised transportation costs. Do you think if behavioural scientists incorporated more ideas from evolutionary psychology, how do you think this would change our conclusions from our, from our studies? If you look at the replication crisis in behavioral science, I made a bet that I'm very lazy and I haven't got a bloody research lab with a large budget, but I've made a bet that the findings in behavioral economics, which made sense in the light of evolutionary psychology, would tend to replicate. Whereas the findings like priming, which I was never totally comfortable with, to be honest, honest, that business that if I, you know, we've done experiments where it kind of works, but it doesn't work spectacularly. And, you know, who knows? But those, that idea that if I keep saying old geriatric, you know, um, uh, you know, Zimmer frame to you and throwing out random words like that in the, for the rest of the conversation, then when you come to leave the room, you'll kind of walk in a stooped and slow fashion. I, I never quite bought into that because it didn't really make any sense. On the other hand, the fact that we, 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 we change our behavior according to social context, right? So that if I come to a dinner party at your house, um, I won't leave cash on the table, okay? And the fact that I don't pay my wife for sex, okay? The fact that actually we, we, we behave more or less economically depending on the context in which we find ourselves, that makes perfect evolutionary sense. And I think those findings will always replicate. No, I mean, it's worth remembering that, you know, some of the instincts we've acquired from the Serengeti are probably uh, inappropriate to our modern, our modern setting or not, or not optimal to a modern setting. So I'm not averse. To, I'm, there are people who go, you must never say bias. But I don't think you should say bias until you've actually investigated the evolutionary origins um, of, of, of an instinct and how they might translate to the modern world. I once didn't buy a house because the guy seemed a bit shifty, okay, a bit shifty. Now, to an economist, you'd basically say, look, that's a ridiculously trivial piece of information. You know, the, the fact that you refused to buy the house because he wouldn't knock any money off the secondhand fridge and wanted you to pay the replacement cost of the fridge is kind of dumb because it's a it's a 400 pound question in a 400,000 pound purchase you know that's a rounding error right but it actually turned out it was a good decision some friends of ours tried to buy the same house and found out the guy was much shiftier than we thought and in fact part of the garden didn't even belong to him it belonged to the rail company next door and he'd basically carved out a whole load of parking spaces from someone else's land okay 
So the house was significantly dodgy and the guy was dodgy. Now, my point about that was that acting on my instinct would be very difficult for me to do that in a business context. If I stood up in front of a board meeting and said, I don't want to do this deal because, you know, the guy just seems a bit, a bit, you know, not really, you know, uh, they go, no, no, I'm terribly sorry. We want a better reason than that. Okay. But my reason is that I've ha I've got embedded somewhere in me a million years of um, evolved experience in spotting who not to trust. And it would be utterly foolish for me to discard that information entirely simply because it doesn't fit into any spreadsheet model we currently know of. And I think what we need is, what we need to improve the world is we need corresponding units, SI units, based on evolutionary foundations of things like trustworthiness, irritation, annoyance, fairness. If we had SI units for uncertainty, irritation, you know, um, if we had an SI unit of regret, you know, we'd start to make progress, I think, in marketing and in the design of products and services and in the design of tax systems, in the design of everything. If we had human centered metrics to match the, the CGS SI units we, and, and, and obviously money, which is a totally stupid measure, money, because a pound, I do not feel the same unit of pain when I spend one pound on one thing versus a pound I spend on something else. You know, the idea that a pound is a pound is a pound and I have a certain amount of utility and I will spend a certain number of pounds. There are, there are, there's money I enjoy spending, there's money I hate spending. There are things which in one frame of reference seem cheap to me, Nespresso, okay? If you sold Nespresso in a jar like Nescafe, it would seem expensive. I persuaded my dad to get Sky TV by saying, he said, 17 pounds a month is too much. I said, it's not 17 pounds a month, it's 60p a day. He said, what difference does that make? You spend two pounds a day on newspapers. Not interested in movies, not interested in sport, really likes factual television, okay? So I said, if you spent two pounds on newspapers, it's not that crazy to spend another 60p a day getting 150 channels of the Smithsonian Channel and PBS and History and National Geographic and Goats of the Serengeti and all that stuff, right? And within a second, oh, I see what you mean. Reframed it, total change in perception of value. So the whole premise of economics that a pound is worth a pound to us is bollocks from the fucking off, right? I mean, it doesn't even stand up to my dad OK, that's how little experimentation you need to basically, you know, disquiet you about your faith in mainstream economics. And I keep saying this to our clients, stop trying to make your products cheaper. Go and find a way to make them seem cheaper. We don't have the concept of emotional efficiency, which is how much of resources and time and cost does it create to create a kind of unit of endorphin rush or whatever it is, where, you know, whatever it is the ultimate end is. And we need that because we're using SI units as an appalling proxy for improving the quality of human life. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of this video. If I had to sum up the three most important lessons from my conversation with Rory, this is what they would be. Firstly, it would be that a lot of the behaviors that we describe as irrational in behavioral science don't really seem that irrational when we consider them from a Darwinian or survival perspective. Secondly, it would be that if we were to use evolutionary economics as a soundboard for our discussion on behavioral economics, we will likely have a better idea of what findings are likely to replicate and what won't. And finally, perhaps we need new SI units of human experiences so we can actively design for them and also justify them in a board meeting. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please remember to subscribe and ring that notification bell. Now in truth, because Rory Sutherland is one of the most interesting people to talk to in the entire world, it did feel almost criminal to cut out as much of the footage of our over an hour long conversation as I did. So I'm going to be uploading the full hour long conversation very shortly if you're interested in watching that. All right, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.